a young father dies in a violent struggle with police. Did the officers beat him to death? Their actions are definitely be under scrutiny. Or did he fall victim to something more mysterious? And he starts acting bizarre, running from the police. Then, an 18-year-old girl dies suddenly in her parents' arms after suffering a seemingly routine miscarriage. I really tried to save her life. The truth behind her death shocks Dr. G. There's no reason you have to die from this. And later, the countdown continues. Are you getting nervous yet? To the big day. Oh, I got lipstick all over you, baby. Altered lives, baffling medical mysteries, shocking revelations. These are the everyday cases of Dr. G, medical examiner. Monday morning rush hour. It's the beginning of an extra crazy week for Dr. Jan Garavaglia, chief medical examiner, mother of two, and bride-to-be. Hi, sweetie. How are you? She and her soon-to-be husband, Dr. Mark Wallace, only had three and a half weeks to plan the entire wedding. We're both very, very busy. We've got school schedules, work schedules, and yet we wanted to be together. Are you getting nervous yet about the wedding? The wedding is just six days away. Brilliant things I gotta do. Plan the flowers, find shoes to match that dress. Final numbers on the uh, dinner. And on top of that, I know I have several cases in the morgue waiting for me. I just read it in the paper. And I'm preparing a talk. I can't wait till I'm married and it's over. I didn't even drink my coffee. At 8.15 a.m., Dr. G begins the day's first autopsy, a young man who died last night in a violent encounter. According to the investigator's report, it unfolded as follows. The police are just driving down the street minding their own business, and this fellow jumps out right in front of their car. The car stops in time, and the man is not hurt. But the real danger is just beginning. They could see that he was in trouble. There was something wrong. Come on, leave me alone. He starts acting bizarre, running from the police. Uh, they actually try to spray pepper spray on him. It didn't help. He runs away, dives back into the street. Soon, other officers arrive on the scene. The struggle quickly escalates. He fights back with unexpected strength. It takes their combined force to finally wrestle the man to the ground and bring him under control. They get him subdued. They've got him handcuffed. He seems to be OK. Sir, can you hear me? Then something sir. shocking happens. The man suddenly falls limp. Okay. Here, All right. As soon as he went unconscious, they called the EMS to get there. They tried, but he was uh, pretty much uh, dead when they got there. Through fingerprints, police identify the man as Toby Holmes, a 30-year-old father of two. And now his family wants to know, how did he die? And are the police to blame? If someone dies um, while in police custody, um, their actions are definitely be under scrutiny. The officers deny using excessive force, but only forensic evidence can prove or disprove their case. You worry about some type of police brutality. A police officer that did that would have been prosecuted. But Dr. G must also consider a second possible cause of death involving the officers. Pepper spray, you know, we have to make sure he's not allergic to pepper spray. He didn't have an asthmatic attack brought on by the pepper spray. Tragedy can occur. People can die even when the police used a force that wasn't supposed to be lethal. Considered an illegal weapon in the UK and Canada, Pepper spray, or oleoresin capsicum, is an oil extract from cayenne peppers that's 300 times as strong as jalapenos. A single dose can be fatal if it triggers a severe asthma attack. But then, Dr. G finds a puzzling detail in the report. After jumping in front of their car, Toby had yelled, just kill me or go away. Basically, the, the guy makes a comment that he would uh, like the police officer to kill him. More than 31,000 people commit suicide in the U.S. each year. On rare occasions, 
they directly involve police officers in a scenario known as suicide by cop. Suicide by cop is, is basically when a person is suicidal and they want the cop to kill them. Typically what we see suicide by cop is that they'll draw a gun on a police officer. You draw a gun on a police officer and he's going to shoot you. That's what he's trained to do. No firearms were involved in Toby Holmes' death. But in speaking with the family, investigators discover a possible warning sign of suicide, a sudden radical change in behavior. Uh, they've contacted his wife. He supposedly very, had been very abusive to her. But recently today, uh, for some reason, prior to this incident, had been very nice to her. According to his wife, Toby had left the house earlier that day in tears, saying he would never see his family again. Little did she know he would be right. Did suicidal intent play a part in Toby's death? If so, it could have repercussions for the investigation across the board. Everybody wants those answers. The family wants those answers. Police executives want those answers. And they're all counting on Dr. G to figure out the truth. Dr. G begins by studying Toby's face, which is covered in cuts and bruises. Let's see. She's on the lookout for signs of excessive force. He's got a contusion to the middle of his forehead. He's got some abrasion on the uh, lateral aspect of the right eye. He's got some cheek abrasions. The wounds provide a snapshot of Toby's fight with the officers. Uh, they certainly subdue him face down, and you know his head goes down on the ground. So it's, it's definitely in a struggle. The external injuries are extensive. But to prove whether or not police had actually caused his death, Dr. G must go inside Toby's body and head. A bruise on the face is a bruise on the face until it affects your brain or causes some trauma internally. For now, she continues with the external exam, searching for any further injuries, self-inflicted or otherwise. Some contusions or bruising around the wrist. They were very classic for a struggling against a uh, handcuff. And on his forearms, she makes a telling discovery. He has multiple scars running along the major veins. So what we see are vascular, kind of linear fibrosis over vessels. He's got a lot of them, a lot of old vascular scars. But these scars are not the result of knife wounds sustained in a suicide attempt. Instead, they're clearly the consequence of drug use, specifically repeated injections of an intravenous narcotic such as heroin. People who shoot up drugs will often uh, shoot things into their system uh, that uh, cause the, the vessels to kind of scar up. One, two, three, four, five, just on the front of that right arm. So he is really shooting up a lot of drug. That was really quite amazing. The scars further complicate Toby's case. They suggest yet another possible cause of death, a drug overdose. But if so, was it accidental or intentional? Suicide, I don't know how that plays into this. Then, as Dr. G takes a closer look at the needle tracks, she discovers one puncture wound on the right hand that commands her attention. It's a needle puncture mark surrounded by pallor, kind of whitening of the skin where there's no blood, and then ecchymosis or bleeding around that area of pallor, uh, which I don't often see. It's a half-inch forensic clue that could clear the officers' names or condemn them as Toby's killers. Coming up next, was Toby suffering from the mysterious and deadly effects of drug abuse? Smashing out windows, big dents in your cars with their fists. Oh my god! When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. Morgue technicians photograph the extensive needle marks on Toby Holmes' arms, looking for clues to his strange behavior and sudden death. Yesterday, after an abrupt farewell to his family, the 30-year-old father of two provoked a fierce and fatal fight with police. 
To explain his demise, Dr. G must untangle a complex web of theories, including police brutality, a reaction to pepper spray, and a suicidal or accidental drug overdose. I am just trying to get to the fact of what happened. And now, she's found a distinctive mark on his hand that may lead to a stunning revelation. She closely inspects the circular wound. The defect is not only familiar, but Dr. G knows it could be the key to solving the case. It's pale with a central needle puncture mark and then bleeding around it. He's actually got a classic uh, cocaine needle puncture mark. Cocaine, a central nervous system stimulant, is most often inhaled through the nose or smoked in the form of crack. But about 10% of addicts inject the drug into their veins for a shorter but more intense high. To Dr. G's expert eye, Toby's puncture wound looks fresh. He may have injected cocaine just before his death. This discovery sheds a whole new light on this complicated case. It's now possible that Toby was suffering from one of the worst effects of cocaine abuse. Not a basic overdose, but a dangerous condition called excited delirium. Typically, uh, these are chronic cocaine users, where this last episode puts them over the edge and they start having delusional, excited thoughts and behavior. While the physiological phenomenon of excited delirium is not fully understood, researchers believe excited delirium is caused by a chemical reaction in the body that triggers violent actions. These are the type of people that are smashing out windows, plate glass windows with their hands, fitting big dents in your cars with their fists. I would run the other way. They would scare me to death. But police cannot just run away. It's their job to bring the violent person under control. Unfortunately, in some cases, the subject dies. There are two possible explanations for excited delirium deaths. The first is that the excited delirium triggered an arrhythmia, an irregular heartbeat that prevented blood flow to Toby's major organs. This would have killed him regardless of any injury sustained in the scuffle. But Dr. G can only make this ruling after eliminating all other options, because arrhythmias leave no tangible proof after they occur. It's a cardiac arrhythmia. The electrical component of the heart isn't causing a uniform beat. So we're not going to see anything. The second possible cause of death, however, would leave hard evidence. If the excited delirium had turned Toby so violent that the officers reacted with extreme force, above and beyond what they needed to restrain him. Was the intervention and the use of force necessary? Was the amount of force justifiable? Was it reasonable? In the heat of the moment, maybe he got a nice blow to the head that I you know, can't see with the hair. I don't know. For answers, Dr. G must now turn to the internal exam. So we're ready to go, right? Ready to go. Dr. G makes the standard Y incision from the shoulders through the torso. She's in search of hard evidence that can pinpoint Toby's killer among many suspects. Pepper spray, a drug overdose, arrhythmia from excited delirium, or trauma. First, she checks the abdominal cavity for excess blood that may have resulted from a beating. Because blood really is the trail to the trauma. Is there blood collected in his abdominal cavity? Could there have been a blow to the liver? Seeing no pools of blood, however, hmm. she proceeds to examine the ribs. A blow to Toby's chest or the weight of officers fighting to subdue him may have broken a rib bone, causing fatal internal injuries. Sometimes a kick can cause a displaced uh, rib to go into a lung or, or a, a, even a heart sometimes but all the ribs appear intact, and the lungs are clear of puncture wounds. We're also looking for evidence of maybe an allergic reaction, possibly from the pepper spray. His bronchi looked fine. They were all patent. The air could go through them. Uh, so that ruled that out. So far, she's found no evidence of any internal trauma inflicted by the police. 
But the internal search for clues to Toby's sudden death is not over. While her assistant takes blood and urine samples for a tox screen, Dr. G continues exploring the possibility of police brutality inside his head. We're looking for, you know, evidence of him having a skull fracture and a blow to the head or something that happened to him that shouldn't have. And her thorough examination reveals no injuries. And there was no skull fractures. Uh, there was no bleeding in the brain, no skull fractures at the base of the skull. Uh, so I really, there was no trauma to the brain. The negative findings add up to one conclusion. The officers are not responsible for killing Toby Holmes with excessive force. There's no proof of that. Nothing, nada. With the autopsy now over, Dr. G can finally eliminate a few theories about Toby's sudden death. He certainly didn't die from trauma. He didn't die from the police beating him up. He didn't have an allergic reaction to the pepper spray. But that still leaves two possibilities remaining. A suicidal overdose or heart arrhythmia brought on by excited delirium. And we have nothing anatomically that we can find at autopsy. So that means it's going to be toxicology. Coming up next, a critical discovery may help Dr. G solve the case of Toby Holmes. Very few things cause you to go from walk and talk in one minute to flatline the next. When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. Dr. G orders a full toxicology screen on Toby Holmes' fluid samples. I gotta see what his levels are. Through a negative autopsy, she's determined that this young father was not a victim of police brutality or pepper spray mishap. But whether he died of a suicidal overdose or suffered from excited delirium depends on the type and amount of drugs he'd taken that day. We just don't look for one thing. I mean, we don't have a hypothesis and let's say that this is cocaine. No, we're looking for everything. You know, what really happened? Let the toxicology speak to me. A few weeks later, the final lab reports arrive. As expected, Toby's blood and urine show the presence of an illicit stimulant, cocaine and the level is not that of a suicidal overdose. He's got cocaine, a pretty you know, hefty amount, but not like super hefty, like we'd see with a massive overdose of cocaine. If this man was truly trying to kill himself, um, he wasn't very efficient at it. For Dr. G, these tox results, together with the negative autopsy findings, leave only one logical explanation for his sudden death. So what we have is a man who died very suddenly after bizarre behavior who has recently used cocaine. Well, that's a setup for that excited delirium. And the actual mechanism of his death may lie in the organ most vulnerable during excited delirium. One minute he's kicking and thrashing, and the second later, he is limp. Very few things cause you to go from walk and talk in one minute to flatline the next. Uh, and that really indicates it's his heart. Now, why would his heart do that? Uh, cocaine can do this to you. Uh, he's clearly dying from a sudden cardiac arrhythmia brought on uh, by that cocaine. Now, Dr. G can finally explain the strange circumstances of Toby's untimely death. After leaving his family, Toby Holmes spends his last hours on Earth injecting cocaine. But he's far from committing suicide with an overdose. Instead, he takes just enough to fuel his addiction. As a drug abuser, Toby's cocaine intoxication is nothing new. Except this time, his body reacts in a shocking way. 
he begins experiencing excited delirium, a condition often associated with chronic cocaine use. Why this time it puts him over the edge, I can't give you that answer. But ultimately what's happening is it starts causing him to get excited, it starts causing him to have some delusional thought, and his heart's beating harder and harder. Wandering down the street, he suddenly jumps in front of a police car, not to commit suicide by cop, but driven by excited delirium. The police officer ends up chasing him. The guy's acting bizarre. In his drug-induced state, Toby resists arrest with tremendous strength. The officers struggle to restrain him, increasing his agitation. But when they finally manage to handcuff him, his heart's beating harder and harder, and he eventually, his heart starts to quiver. It doesn't beat anymore, it just quivers. The quivering, or arrhythmia, prevents the heart from pumping any blood. With no blood circulating in his system, Toby suddenly collapses and dies in the arms of the officers. We need EMS ASAP. Clark. And then conclusion and consideration of circumstances surrounding the death. Dr. G files the autopsy report as a case of excited delirium. No officers are charged with his death. For his family, the findings are not easy to accept. Some of them just don't understand this whole phenomena. Some of them cannot believe that trauma didn't kill uh, their loved ones. They had The police had to have done something wrong. Coming up next, Dr. G discovers shocking evidence in the case of a young girl who died after a miscarriage. If she had been diagnosed properly, she'd be alive. And later, wedding plans come down to the wire. Talking to the next of kin one second, and then they'd be talking about flowers. Flower girl, my niece. When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. Woo! Dr. Garavaglia, Garavaglia Wallace wedding this Saturday. As I chief medical examiner and a oh, bride-to-be, Dr. G's lunch break there. isn't about lunch. It's about juggling two worlds. Planning that wedding, having those phone calls come in, and you know, you'd be talking to the deceased next to kin one second, and then the phone would ring and they'd be talking about flowers. And so if you could arrange for some rose petals. You know, and then I'd put it down and I'd be talking to a detective one second, and then you know, I'd still have to be, you know, reminders that uh, I hadn't picked the, the, the menu yet. Allergic to the nuts and the dairy. I can't believe how you remember everything. It was kind of tipping me over the edge. There. I mean, it's just too much. All right, thank you very much. I'll we'll meet on but Saturday. But before long, Dr. G's lunch break is over, and it's time to direct her attention to another case. Well, thank you very much. You've been great. Bye bye. All right, we have two more. Back in full work mode, Dr. G reads the investigator's report for her next autopsy. So. We have a sad case today. The decedent is Isabel Foster, an 18-year-old just out of high school. An independent spirit and avid dancer, Isabel had her heart set on studying musical theater when she got to college in the fall. At the time of her death, however, she was still living at home with her parents, recovering from one of the most traumatic events in her life. Seven days earlier, she'd gone to the hospital uh, complaining of some unusual vaginal bleeding, and they found out she was pregnant. After taking a sonogram of her uterus, the doctor tells Isabel that her bleeding is from an early miscarriage, and that the embryo, just seven weeks old, would soon pass naturally. A couple days, they were just going to treat it conservatively, just watching her. Shaken by the experience, Isabel goes home. After two more follow-up visits, her ordeal seems to be over. The doctor finds no evidence of the embryo. Then, just a day and a half later. She's watching TV on the couch. She falls asleep. The, the family thinks she's just taking a nap. But when they try to wake her up, she doesn't respond. It's Frank. It's Something is terribly wrong. 
Isabel's father immediately calls 911, and paramedics rush her to the emergency room. But it's too late. And uh, she's basically dead on arrival to the hospital. Isabel's sudden death stuns her parents and fills Dr. G's mind with questions. We have a young girl, late teens, uh, that's dead on the couch. I mean, what could it be? Does it relate to the miscarriage at all? Miscarriages occur in up to 20% of pregnancies and are often the body's natural mechanism of aborting an unhealthy baby. In most cases, hormonal changes prompt the uterus to shed its lining along with the embryo, causing bleeding and severe cramping. While often emotionally traumatic, miscarriages usually cause no physical problems. But on rare occasions, there are at least two complications that can be fatal and may have killed Isabel. One is if the bleeding doesn't stop. If the pregnancy does not completely uh, uh, miscarry, if she has not com completed the process, the patient can lose a significant amount of blood. And that tends to be the most common complication that we'll see. Another danger is if an infection takes hold and sends toxic bacteria into a woman's blood. You always do have a small risk of infection because you have exposure of the uh, organisms that are in the vagina to the uterus. Isabel's full medical records could shed more light on the mystery, but they're held up at the hospital. All we're getting is um, what the EMS told the hospital. Did Isabel die as a result of a complication from the miscarriage? Could the death have been prevented? They are counting on Dr. G for answers. As Dr. G starts the external exam, she learns from the investigator's report that paramedics had made every effort to revive Isabel. She has a lot of medical intervention. They really tried to save her life. Her first task is to catalog and inspect each item of Isabel's clothing. As we normally do in forensic, you know, sometimes clothing can give us hints of what's going on. If Isabel had continued to hemorrhage due to her miscarriage, Dr. G would expect to find blood stains on Isabel's underwear or sanitary pad, but she finds nothing. It appears Isabel was not bleeding vaginally when she died. So maybe the miscarriage, you know, did we get the right story? Because I don't have her medical record yet. And, uh, or maybe she's over the miscarriage, but she certainly didn't have any blood in her panties. Next, Dr. G checks Isabel's airways for a possible drug overdose. Occasionally from drug abuse, we'll see uh, foam in the nose and the mouth, but we don't always see that. That's just, you know, a kind of a little telltale sign. It doesn't uh, give us the answer. Uh, oftentimes we see drug overdoses with nothing in the nose or mouth. Isabel's nose and mouth are clear, but nevertheless, Dr. G will continue exploring the possibility of an overdose later in the autopsy. Next, as with all autopsies she performs, Dr. G examines Isabel's body from head to toe, searching for clues. We didn't really expect to find anything. No, she looks like a normal, you know, young woman. But then, she notices something very subtle. Isabel's stomach feels slightly distended to the touch. Could this be some kind of fluid from an injury or undetected disease? Could even just be uh, changes in po you know, post-mortem. So it really is hard to tell what that little rounded abdomen is from. The answers will have to wait until she opens Isabel's body. Okay, did you take her ID picture? Mm -hmm. Okay, she's, she's all First, Dr. G makes the standard Y incision. When she folds back the skin and subcutaneous fat, she immediately sees what made Isabel's belly soft. And it's not just any fluid. There's a major pool of blood in the abdominal cavity. Depending on size, the average human body contains about four liters of blood which flows through the cardiovascular system, delivering oxygen to the vital organs. If more than 30% of Isabel's blood, about 1.2 liters, had drained into her abdomen, it would have been fatal. And you're in shock because you just don't have enough blood in the vessels, it's all accumulating into your abdomen, and you die. Uh, your heart doesn't get enough blood, and your brain doesn't get enough blood. They measure this blood in the... Uh... To see how much blood Isabel has lost, Dr. G methodically removes it from her body. 
We ladle it out with the soup ladle that we use, um, collect that, and measure it. But I can't look where it's coming from until it's all out of there. The total amount is shocking. A full two liters had drained out of Isabel's cardiovascular system. Okay. Dr. Jean now knows what killed Isabel. The young girl bled to death internally. That's clearly why she died. Now we've got to figure out why that's there. Coming up next, could Isabel's killer be a common procedure used to treat her miscarriage? It can result in disastrous consequences. When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. A week after doctors told Isabel Foster she had suffered a miscarriage, the 18-year-old's parents found her unconscious on the couch, never to wake again. This would not be something we would expect. We see blood where it's not supposed to be here. Dr. Jean now surveys Isabel's internal organs in situ, or in place. She's just bled into her abdominal cavity. Organs like her brain, her lungs, everything looks real pale. Dr. G has discovered that Isabel lost half her blood through internal bleeding. But how? Often, internal bleeding is caused by an injury to a major organ, such as the liver or spleen, or when blood vessels are diseased or torn by broken bones. But in Isabel's case, Dr. G suspects the hemorrhage could be related to the reported miscarriage. This is uh, abnormal. <laughs> the girl may have suffered complications from a follow-up procedure called a DNC, or dilation and curatage. It's a common follow-up to a miscarriage to make sure all the products of conception are out of the uterine cavity. In a DNC, the doctor scrapes out the lining of the uterus. Examining this lining can reveal why the miscarriage occurred. As minor as it is, however, a DNC is a surgical procedure. And up to 10% of cases result in complications, ranging from infections to trauma from the sharp instruments. The most common risks with a DNC are perforation of the uterus. You could have injury to organs uh, around the uterus, such as the ovaries, the tubes, the, the intestines. So it can result in disastrous consequences, uh, even in the best of hands. So, Without the full medical records, Dr. G can't know for sure whether Isabel had had a DNC. If she had, her massive blood loss could be from a serious puncture wound. To determine this, Dr. G homes in on Isabel's reproductive organs. And you just l gently lift up some of the small intestines and you can expose the uterus. But the uterus appears intact. No perforations from a DNC. Instead, she finds the culprit just inches from the uterus. Lo and behold, I mean, you can see quite readily uh, where that bleeding is from. Clearly, we had about a 1.8 centimeter defect, a hole, right in the middle of the fallopian tube. Fallopian tubes are thin conduits that carry a woman's eggs from her ovaries to her uterus. Somehow, Isabel's left tube has been torn open. OK. Oh, she's OK. Hold on. Dr. G immediately realizes what must have caused the hole in Isabel's fallopian tube, an ectopic pregnancy. An ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that has developed outside the uterus, outside its normal location. A healthy pregnancy takes place in the uterus, where the baby has plenty of room to grow. But in up to one in 40 pregnancies, a fertilized egg on its way to the uterus gets stuck in the fallopian tube, either because it is too narrow or because of previous scarring from surgery or a sexually transmitted disease. There, the embryo implants itself, digging deeper into the tube as it grows, until the walls can no longer sustain the pregnancy and they rupture. Now, a fallopian tube is not very little. Um, it does not have the capacity to expand to hold a baby, like a uterus. And it just basically uh, erodes right through it. Fallopian tubes can never hold a baby. Uh, they're doomed. Let me know if it's enough. Take her heart Despite the risk of a fatal rupture, however, ectopic pregnancies don't often end in death. It's rare. We don't see these anymore. 
That's because doctors can typically remove the embryo surgically to prevent the fallopian tube from bursting. But the hospital never diagnosed Isabel's ectopic pregnancy. Instead, they had supposedly observed and treated her for a normal uterine pregnancy and miscarriage. It's a puzzling contradiction. So we're gonna cut the uterus off. That's when she cuts open the organ, off. Dr. G makes a shocking discovery. The lining is still there, and there is no sign that an embryo was ever implanted. We don't see anything uh, to suggest a pregnancy. The intact lining is proof that Isabel was not killed by a complication from a miscarriage, because she never had one. It also confirms that she never had a DNC, the follow-up procedure that would have warned doctors of her abnormal pregnancy. I mean, if she had been diagnosed properly, uh, she'd be alive. Suddenly, explosive questions arise from this revelation. How could the hospital have made such an egregious error? This is what killed her. Coming up next, the forensic clues add up to devastating answers and plenty of frustration. I don't understand how this happened in this day and age. Then, the big day finally arrives. Yeah. When Dr. G, medical examiner, continues. Dr. G wraps up Isabel Foster's autopsy, her mind already analyzing the findings. There's no doubt that the 18-year-old girl bled to death from a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. The hole right in the middle of the fallopian tube. But just a week ago, she had been diagnosed with a normal miscarriage. She'd gone to the hospital uh, complaining of some unusual vaginal bleeding. So why didn't they catch her ectopic pregnancy? You know, did we get the right story? The intact uterus, the two liters of blood, the silent death. Now, after adding up all the clues from her investigation, Dr. G reconstructs what she believes were the likely events leading up to Isabel Foster's death. About a week before she dies, Isabel begins experiencing heavy abdominal cramps and vaginal bleeding. Concerned, she goes to the hospital, where an ultrasound shows no baby in her womb. Then. Instead of exploring the possibility of an ectopic pregnancy, the doctor diagnoses a miscarriage. I think what they happened is they didn't find any, uter any evidence of uh, pregnancy in the uterus and assumed she was having a miscarriage because of the bleeding. You know, that is one of the problems that th this can mimic. It's not unusual for these women to bleed a little bit like a miscarriage. The doctor's assumption is a crucial mistake. Convinced that Isabel is having a normal miscarriage, she apparently fails to conduct some critical tests, such as tracking hormone levels. We want to know now, what is the level of pregnancy hormone? I mean, is this a normally positioned pregnancy or an ectopic pregnancy? In addition, for unknown reasons, the doctor also decides against doing a DNC. Without this follow-up, she doesn't realize that the pregnancy was never in the uterus, and Isabel's condition remains misdiagnosed. Within a few days, the cramping and bleeding subside, and Isabel believes her miscarriage is over. But in fact, the embryo is still there, inside her fallopian tube. It's been growing now for seven weeks, stretching the tube beyond capacity. When the tube expands, there may be some temporary relief of pain, which sometimes can be misinterpreted by the patient as everything getting better. Instead, the danger only gets worse until finally the walls of the tube give way. Then she bleeds out, and she bleeds out through the fallopian tube. Half a liter, one liter, a liter and a half. Undetected, the hemorrhage becomes fatal and the blood is spilling out from the hole. You're not getting enough blood to the brain, and eventually you pass out. Right there on the couch, Isabel slips into shock. By the time her parents realize something is wrong, it's too late. She's lost too much blood, and she dies. Despite what appears to be a series of errors, Isabel's parents never bring charges against the doctor or the hospital. But for Dr. G, 
the bottom line is clear. If you're diagnosed prior to it breaking open, uh, there's no reason you have to die from this. Uh, they, they have good ways to treat this. I don't understand how this happened in this day and age. It's really not my job to put the blame, but on this one, she sure fell through the cracks uh, with medical science. I wish somebody would have uh, picked up on this. Another case, another workday is over. And now it's finally time for Dr. G to leave the dead and celebrate life with her loved ones. I'm always very happy to be in the board. There's no question about that. I'm very thankful that I live in a world that uh, shows me how important living is. But once in a while, I'd like to feel thankful, not because I'm standing next to a dead man with multiple gunshot wounds, that I'm thankful that I'm looking over a beautiful scene, you know, at the ocean. <laughs> Just don't go. Okay. I was very, very worried uh, coming up to the wedding. There is no question I wanted to marry Mark. He's the love of my life. But I love my boys, and my older boy was having a very hard time that I had divorced his father, and, and now I'm marrying somebody different and bringing somebody different in their lives. And uh, he pretty much told me he wasn't going to accept it. And, um, and I had to respect that. But he's such a beautiful kid. I mean, at first he was not going to come to the wedding at all. And then uh, at the last minute, as I'm walking out uh, to the ceremony, I saw him sitting there. And that meant a lot to me. Uh, my younger one, you know, you always worry how they're accepting it, but he's very, very loving, and he's the one that walked me down the aisle. I have enough love for all of us. And once they see that I'm not going to lessen their love just by loving Mark, um, I think they're, they're accepting uh, more that uh, we could be a family unit. Mark, I've never felt as happy. <laughs> And in love as I am with you, I really believe our love's a gift from God. I vow to love you with all my heart until the day I die. He asked me to marry him approximately 28 years ago. And, uh, you know, I said no, and I had regretted it the rest of my life. I vow to be faithful and honest and true to you and myself. I was thinking with my mind instead of my heart. I was a scientist, that's what I was trained to do. I thought that was the way to do it. That's how you planned your life. But sometimes I guess I'm proven wrong that there, you know, the matters of love don't necessarily, uh, are, are something you should do with your mind. Sometimes you have to follow your heart. Give me a kiss your wife. outside besides this morgue. There's something else in life besides my kids and my mor in the morgue. <laughs> that is just wonderful. They want the U incision, not the Y. <laughs> Any wishes for Dr. Mark? Good <laughs> <laughs>